Francois, how are you today? Thank you so much, uh, Alicia. Delighted to be here, and I'm I'm very well, thank you. I'm just privileged uh, to be here. Thanks to uh, the organisers and to the Commission for inviting us to to bring some perspectives uh, into this important summit in this critical time in the world. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, the chair of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship was actually with you yesterday, Mrs. Hilda Schwab. She gave uh, an opening statement. Uh, at the opening session yesterday of the European Social Economy Summit. Uh, I'm the director of the foundation and, as you said, also head of social innovation at the World Economic Forum. Tackling the current pandemic, the inequality that we have globally and climate change are the greatest challenges of our time. All of these are global projects beyond our national borders uh, and sectors and require multi-state collaboration, our collective action and our solidarity. Look, for example, what's happening in India right now. They require redesigning our global systems, our policies and rules that constrain and hold back our progress, and they require deep participation and meaningful contributions from citizens, organizing actors in the social economy to really be transformative. As we've witnessed over these last two days, and I've participated in a couple of sessions at the summit, we see Europe progressing and committing herself to real action on advancing the social economy. But this is also reflected in many efforts around the world by public and private sector actors to support the role of social economy actors. So this session is really entitled Allies in a Global Movement, Social Inclusion in Sustainable Economic Recovery. Because we need to come together with Europe uh, and recognize that this social economy is a global collective and interdependent effort, despite very different national and regional contexts. We also really want to explore the role of governments and business, international institutions and networks in facilitating and driving this inclusive recovery. And we want to create this bi-directional exchange and open opportunities for collaboration between international efforts and Europe along dimensions of solidarity, inclusive and global economies. So I'm delighted to be here and really welcome a, a panel that I'm so privileged to host. As I mentioned, the World Economic Forum is the international organization for public-private cooperation. Uh, the Schwab Foundation, in the context of this, over the last two decades, has built a community of leading social innovators across its grassroots movements, uh, hybrid nonprofits, and social businesses. And we work with our partners, uh, leading corporations and governments and international institutions to support them. During 2020, uh, we organized and convened one of the largest coalitions of support actors for social entrepreneurs called the COVID Response Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs, who joined me in hosting today's session. We've been working with partners like Euclid, uh, a key partner to the European Commission, Ashoka, Echo and Green, International Nations, and companies, 85 members in total, representing over 100,000 social entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, delighted that uh, we'll also be talking about the role of Deloitte in joining the Alliance uh, and, and welcoming them on our panel today. In the context of this, we've been recognizing leading social entrepreneurs uh, and also public social innovators, some of whom we'll meet today. And finally, we've been helping to support a grassroots driven movement of social entrepreneurs called Catalyst 2030, who we're in strategic partnership with as a global bottom-up movement of social innovators working across the world collaboratively towards sustainable development goals. So I'm deeply honored uh, to host uh, an incredible set of leaders uh, that I'll introduce now uh, and will join me in this conversation to th thinking about the international dimensions, regional dimensions, among allies in this global movement with Europe. First of all, welcome uh, to Sharon Thorne, the chair of uh, Deloitte's Global Board of Directors. Uh, Sharon is a champion for collective action on environmental sustainability and climate change and has long championed Deloitte's ambition to have higher representation of women leadership globally. Prior to leading the board, she was deputy CEO, managing partner and of global uh, and strategy for Deloitte Northwest Europe and has more than 30 years of experience and clients across many sectors. She also spent more than three decades on boards and advisory councils and relevant to uh, today, has been a member of the advisory council of accountability for sustainability, 
the Social Progress Imperative Board of Directors, and the Stewardship Board of the World Economic Forum's Platform for Shaping the Future of the New Economy, amongst many others. Welcome, Sharon. Um, joining uh, her and, and on the panel, Jonathan Wong, Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, UNESCAP. Uh, Jonathan is supporting social enterprise, supporting governments uh, on social enterprise, inclusive business, and impact investing policy. He joined uh, the UN from the UK uh, Department of International Development, where he was the inaugural head of innovation, and he led the UK's overseas assistance programs on social entrepreneurship and impact investing. He also led the establishment of several high-profile innovation initiatives, including the Global Innovation Fund, many of you will know, and the Amplify program, and an open innovation platform. So welcome, uh, Jonathan. And of course, uh, from India, our thoughts uh, with you, Mirai, to welcome Mirai Chatterjee, the chairperson of uh, the Self-Employed Women's Association Cooperative Federation, um, which is uh, makes up 106 women's primary cooperatives, over 1.8 million women, mostly in rural India. She's also the director of their social security team and <clears throat> also is responsible for healthcare, childcare, and insurance programs. Uh, and is chairperson of the National Insurance Cooperative and the Health Cooperative for CIA. She joined in 1984 after the General Secretary, as its General Secretary, after its founder, Ella Butt, that many of you will know has been pioneer in this movement. Uh, Mirai serves uh, on many advisory uh, boards uh, and also as the chairperson of the Global Informal Workers and Policymakers Network, WIGO, uh, and also the Public Health Foundation of India and was advisor to the National Commission for Enterprises in the unorganized sector um, on the community action of the National Rural Health Mission. She's been a commissioner to the World Health Organization's Commission on Social Determinants in Health and a member of the high-level expert group on universal health coverage. I probably don't need to go on much further other than to say, Mirai, we're privileged to have you with us today. Finally, and certainly last but not least, early morning from Santiago in Chile, uh, Gonzalo Munoz, the CEO of Triciclos, a social entrepreneur himself, a co-founder of Sistema B, uh, the B-Lab movement in Latin America, and the high-level champion for COP25 in Chile, uh, the Triciclos uh, operates in 13 countries in Latin America, uh, really building a movement uh, and implementing the circular economy and recycling. Uh, its mission is to foster a world without waste and, and offers an innovative services and products to help the environment while being financially sustainable. It was the first certified B Corp outside North America. And as I mentioned, uh, Gonzalo was nominated as the high level climate champion for COP25 and now uh, together with Nigel Topping uh, in COP26 uh, remains and leads the race to uh, zero uh, initiatives. So thank you so much to all of you for, for joining today. I am, uh, wanted to bring towards this conversation in Europe some global and regional perspectives. I don't need to go into too much detail in how COVID, in, COVID has impacted social enterprises, women and minority-led businesses, nonprofits, and community organizations around the world. What we're interested to hear from all of you is how these, uh, this impact has been responded to by governments and what does in Europe need to hear and think about uh, what is happening outside. Perhaps Sharon, I'll invite you to, to start and, and to ask us uh, and to share with us what innovative responses have governments developed that might be sustained towards supporting greater social inclusion uh, and support of these enterprises as we look towards what is in reality will be quite an uneven uh, recovery period. Okay, well, thank you, Francois, and absolutely thrilled to be here uh, and share some reflections. At the start of the pandemic, uh, you know, governments looked to the traditional economic toolkit of fiscal and monetary stimulus. That toolkit was designed for managing primarily financial shocks. However, the pandemic has been a shock to the real economy. People were literally unable to go to work or to the shops during lockdown. And there was a mismatch between the nature of the shock and the tools available for governments to respond with. Now, over time, we've seen a number of innovations from governments and other institutions around the world that provide some indicators to how economic policy can incorporate principles of resilience and inclusion more effectively. Many countries have embraced digital innovation to overcome data gaps 
and reach low-income households and marginalised populations with direct cash transfers. For example, in Bangladesh, food producers are embracing different technologies. They're using mobile phones, web-based messaging services, digital money, and online meeting platforms. And that's to ensure that rural food supply chains have operated effectively during COVID and importantly, eliminated food waste. And in Morocco, widespread usage of smartphones enabled the government readily to provide liquidity to workers in the informal economy offering stimulus through monthly mobile pay payments. And when this, pro this payment program started in April 2020, 85% of eligible households in the informal sector were covered. Now, Deloitte is committed to playing our part in addressing the social inequalities faced by so many. We were doing this pre-COVID and have increased our activities to help combat the challenges. One country that you've already referenced, you know, seen devastating challenges recently is, of course, India. And this week, the government of Harania, a state in northern India with a population of over 20 million, 25 million, launched the LIFE project with support from Deloitte. And this LIFE project is a supervised virtual home care initiative to help people quickly access health care for mild to moderate symptoms of COVID-19. Pilot project has begun in the district of Karnal and hopefully will roll out to other effective areas. And what's been achieved in the first three weeks is amazing and we know that lives are being saved. We're really proud of the team. And the approach provides individuals with support and resources to manage their care at home and therefore helps by not overwhelming hospitals. For example, they can recover at home under the care of community health workers and with daily telephone support from medical students. We've created isolation rooms in local school buildings where people can recover in isolation, receive more hands-on medical care. We've also hired eight ambulances to transport patients to the main district hospital if they need more intensive medical care. And we're also working in the community to give people the confidence that they can recover from COVID. For example, by developing and distributing information pamphlets across the district to increase awareness. So to enable that pilot, we've provided open source technology, organizational practices and playbooks, which have been adopt, adopted by some of the top government agencies and medical institutions in India and elsewhere, which has enabled the government to quickly scale the support required to address COVID search surges. And so we're hopeful that the learnings captured from these efforts will be used to drive new models of public health engagement and collaboration. Thank you so much, Sharon. I, I know also your uh, public sector practices have been working uh, extensively looking at policies around uh, small to medium enterprises and uh, social enterprises around the world and, and how in this period uh, there have been a range of different policy and government responses. I think um, within Europe there is a lot to learn and, and, and share from your experiences around the world and the innovations you've just uh, given examples of both in Bangladesh and India. Um, thanks for that. Sticking with India, I'm going to invite Mirai Chatterjee to come in. Uh, clearly, in, in, in contrast to Europe, the informal economy is a significant portion, uh, by far the majority uh, proportion of the workforce. Um, so how can social economy organizations from both the global north and the global south support the revival and resilience and rejuvenation of collective social enterprises to advance livelihoods? Thank you, Francois, and thanks for the invitation to be here at this difficult time. I think it's important for us to share ideas, strategies, and solidarity, and that's why I'm here in the middle of our relief work. Um, I'd like to first of all give a little snapshot of the scale of the issues that some countries like mine face. 93% of the Indian workforce is informal. And we are speaking of upwards of 500 million people who are poor, vulnerable, and largely invisible, many of them migrant workers. If I speak of the female workforce in India, it's almost everybody. 94% of all women in India are informal workers. And of course, they are the worst hit by this health crisis, the livelihood crisis that is immediately following along with this. 
And of course, they are their care work at home, taking care of the elderly, the sick and the vulnerable has increased tremendously, especially as children have been out of school for so long and out of childcare. So the reason I mentioned this, Francois, is that our support and strategies to reach informal workers have to be developed keeping this reality in mind. I should also mention that the vast majority of informal workers are self-employed. They have no employer. And unfortunately, we do not have good data on who they are. There are no registration systems at this time for informal workers, although that is now in the pipeline. I would also like to mention that the enterprises, the collective social enterprises that informal workers have painstakingly bit by bit built up over the years are barely surviving. Many have collapsed and others are in urgent need of revival. Our experience points to the fact that the most effective way to reach informal workers is through their very own organizations, their membership-based organizations, where they are the users, managers, and owners. So by definition, these organizations are inclusive and try to include the poorest and the weakest and the most vulnerable. Also, these organizations already have networks on the ground, at the grassroots. Their feet are firmly on the ground, and so are their eyes and ears and they can move in a quick and agile manner. They know who the workers are, who has COVID, who is sick, and in an atmosphere of fear where people do not want to get tested, do not want to get vaccinated, they offer support, comfort, and so on. These are unions, cooperatives, and self-help groups, and their federations, so many different type of social economy and collective organizations. I'd like to focus a little bit on what is needed. Uh, yes, one more thing I'd like to say about in the how part is that these organizations are registered and they have elected boards, democratically elected boards. They are transparent and accountable. And in our case, they're regulated by the government of India. So that's another reason uh, why investing in these or working in these organizations would be a worthwhile effort to actually reach the informal workers, particularly women workers. What is needed? Um, today we are still, I'm afraid, still in the health emergency mode. We are still in the relief mode and it will continue for several weeks to come. Uh, the urban areas seem to be somewhat, the, the cases seem to be somewhat abating, although data is always a problem with us. But in the rural areas, unfortunately, COVID is still rampant. So we're in the relief stage, and I'm really happy to report, and we have been very touched at the solidarity that we have already received from social economy organizations, both in the north and in the south, so that quickly we were able to prepare emergency health kits with oximeter, thermometer, paracetamol, some immune boosters, masks, of course. Uh, we were able to get oxygen concentrators when even the government primary health centers had none. Um, and now, of course, with the support, this solidarity support from overseas and nationally, we are preparing food kits because people have no livelihood. Informal workers, today they work and earn, today they eat and can feed their children. They don't earn, they have very little staying capacity and their savings quickly get used up. The other thing we've been able to do with the solidarity support from both the North and the South is to develop online uh, teleconsultation with doctors who have offered their services. And of course, we are a multilingual country. So we already have doctors online in 11 languages. Um, the second thing, very quickly now, we are seeing a huge, we're staring at a huge livelihood crisis. Livelihoods of the working poor in our country have been devastated, as I mentioned. So the first thing we would suggest, and we've been saying this to our own government and also overseas donors, is the creation of a livelihood fund for rebuilding. They should be decentralized in the states and even down to our districts and blocks. And this livelihood fund would offer working capital uh, to the social enterprises. We've had some experience of this in the first wave, 
And we found it was critical to help these cooperatives and small women's enterprises uh, stand up and begin working again. So the fund can provide working capital. It can give soft loans. It can cover fixed costs of some of the enterprises. People haven't had salaries and any income for months and months. It can also support individual micro-entrepreneurs and it can provide marketing support. Importantly, it can help these tiny and nano and micro enterprises digitalize. One of the big issues in, at this time has been that there's been a very big digital divide, gender digital divide. Also, the poorest don't have smartphones. Generally, women don't have smartphones, so they need devices, they need digital literacy to come and out of this and build their livelihood, build their resilience and rebuild. I'm also happy to say that already we have received support from UK cooperative movement. It was very touching that small cooperatives across the UK contributed and have already helped us create a small livelihood fund where soon we will be dispersing working capital to some of the enterprises. Second, we need the support of our friends, sisters and brothers in the North and South to support a global universal social protection campaign. It's high time. We have seen in countries like mine, which have underinvested in public health and insurance, micro insurance even, what has been the result. Um, so I, I know that the European Union and many European countries have rich experience in this for many years. We'd like to learn from you. We have some of our own models and experiences, but I think a social protection fund Universal Social Protection Fund is immediately required and already supported by the ILO. Third, invest, perhaps in joint ventures, join hands with these tiny micro nano enterprises, particularly those which are run by women, and help us by marketing, buy our products. We've been saying to our government of India, why don't you issue an order and buy products made by these tiny and micro and nano enterprises, particularly women, at least give some weightage uh, when you do your big purchases of masks, sanitizers, food, and so on, and also services. The service sector in India has been devastated, our domestic workers cooperative, cleaners cooperative. So these are some of the issues that we're facing. And as I said, we are happy that we have had some solidarity and we look forward to working together in partnership, building, rebuilding, and also to build our resilience so that we can face, hopefully not, but future pandemics and disasters. Thank you. Thank you, Mirai, so much for both the perspectives and also some very tangible um, recommendations uh, for, for all of us to think about. Um, <clears throat> also just showing the, the, the critical role that social economy actors play in times of crisis, but also what we could do and learn from in terms of policy making um, uh, for the future. You also supposed to uh, the the role um, of uh, the, the that we as internet actors uh, and that companies and, and others can play and governments can play in in the in the procurement uh, of products and services. And I think that's an important point. I want to move to Latin America and, and welcome and invite uh, uh, Gonzalo Munoz to talk a little bit about obviously his work and what we can learn from the Sistema Bear movement in Latin America um, as a private model of self-regulation when we're thinking also about government regulation and incentives. Uh, what does Sistema Bear offer? Um, and, and, and welcome Gonzalo, early morning for you. Thank you so much, Francois, and also, of course, thanks to the European Social Economy Summit and to the Schwab Foundation for inviting me to this great panel. Uh, well, first, let, let's set the, the conversation around the idea that companies, every type of company, should, should always be a provider of a solution and never feel comfortable on creating problems for society. Okay, so let's try to base the idea of, in, in, in in, in that in that concept, uh, so we we feel like companies must be committed to the creation of public goods, and and not just of course shareholders' financial value. And probably uh, the COVID pandemic, and of course the climate crisis, and the situation that we're living around the world is 
showing that as a, as a reality, but also as an opportunity for all businesses to understand that if you're not creating social and public good, then you might be uh, you might be failing in this moment and, and, and definitely failing for the future. The point then is, how do you measure that impact, that social good, that public value in a way that is effective and that is credible? Uh, the, in, the, in the B Corp community, we operate based on what's called the B Impact Assessment, a credible tool that measures the, the company based on the, of course, the business model, but also the labor practices, environmental practices, the relationship with society through the providers, through the communities, through the employees, um, the levels of transparency. So uh, the B Impact Assessment, that tool is now being used by more than 120,000 companies all around the world uh, that, that are uh, aligning to, to search for those certainties. And, and then also that tool is connected to the SDGs uh, through the SDG Action Manager. So also connected to what we understand, all of us, like what is the global agenda. The use of that tool, the use of the the the, the B impact assessment has increased 38% in the last year during the pandemic. That's a really important signal of how much the business sector has learned on the importance of increasing the resilience of connecting to the situations that we're living around the world in many aspects. But then that impact cannot be standing alone. That should connect to at least, I would say, four groups uh, in order to propose the systemic improvements that we require. Nobody can solve the problems alone and nobody can even imagine that not only their institution, but their sector in the economy can solve the problem. It's all about the in, the interconnection uh, and the interdependence that, that we have to first recognize and then work with. So the first and the evident one is the connection to, to the financial sector. And we're seeing everywhere around the world how, for example, the um, ESG parameters are increasing in terms of attraction and they're being used much more. That means that a sector that was mostly uh, dedicated to creating uh, financial impact is now understanding that that financial impact will never stand alone. That financial impact will even decrease if you don't take into consideration aspects around environment, social, the proper governance and creating a culture that understand that the world gets riskier and riskier more and more if we don't really embed those elements and really integrate them into the value creation, into the business model, into the way we interact with other institutions, with people, with nature. Um, so, so we see a, a relevant move there. Then the other element is public policy level. This movement of companies should provide the conditions for the politicians to implement, to increment and, and improve the, pol the, 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 the at the policy level. Then the academic, we ha we really expect that the ins the academic institutions all around the world should be able to integrate uh, these elements into the way they teach. And, and finally, the broader society. That's why we're called Sistema B, just like uh, the interest is declared by the European Commission in terms of creating an ecosystem that operates, uh, integrating all of the actors, but working for all of the actors. Gracias, Gonzalo. I was going to ask you, given Latin America has been so influential, uh, such a strong uh, history of social movements and, and the social economy, but also now uh, through the business perspective, bringing the, the social inclusion angle and you know, with the work on Sistema B, how that is starting to converge and come together. Um, I want, I'll come back to that because I want to invite Jonathan uh, in for a moment to um, uh, give us some perspectives um, from Asia Pacific, particularly on the range of policy advances um, in, in your regions uh, that you work in uh, and how they align or, or differ from European models. You clearly work directly with governments on, on their policies for uh, social entrepreneurship and impact investing. I think this is a great time to, to hear uh, and get an update from you. Jonathan, welcome. 
Great, thank you very much. Um, on alignment, I, I mean, certainly we're seeing um, alignment on government ambition to build back better from the pandemic with economies that work, uh, if you like, better for society and environment and, and, and not just the bottom line. O on differences, I, no, I, I'm painfully aware I, I'm, 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 I'm from the UK and the UK is not part of the EU. Um, but let me comp but it's an, it's a it's a market I know well in terms of social entrepreneurship and social economy. So let me compare that to what we're seeing in Asia with governments. Uh, and I'm sure many of these points will be pertinent to other countries as well um, in, in Europe. So, so let me just make two points. I, I think the first point I will make, which was quite interesting, was that in the UK, social enterprise policy in particular was driven from the pri from, from civil society sector. It was really a question of how can the civil society use an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, to, 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 to more effectively solve the, the, the challenges and problems um, that, that they're looking to solve. Uh, certainly in Southeast Asia, we're seeing it more driven from the private sector uh, and really policies there to incentivize the private sector to, if you like, solve the most pressing social and environmental challenges of our time. So I've, I found that was quite interesting, just the direction of policy, one from civil society, one from private sector. But this, the second point was quite, quite interesting was that in the UK, the social enterprise policy was a standalone policy, while in many countries in Asia, it's more of an integrated policy. So let's give an example. In Vietnam, um, social entrepreneurship is embedded within the SME Act. Now, the, on, on, the, on, on kind of what, why this is important and why this is interesting, I, I think the key point I would like to make is that social economy policy is still very much in its infancy if, if we look at it in, in the grand scale of things. And, and for me, if there's one key point I would want to make is that given that social enterprise policy and social economy policy is in its infancy, policy evaluation should really be a priority if we are to build back better um, um, and, and build an effective policy environment for the social economy. Um, we need to know kind of what policies work and what don't under which cultures, context and level of social economy development. And just to give you an example, um, on the point I raised around kind of in the UK, there was a, there was a standalone social enterprise policy, while in, in age, many Asian countries we are seeing integrated policies within broader policies. I, I heard earlier today that the social economy policy will be part of the EU industrial policy. Now, I have a question here, and, 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 and two questions really. I mean, one, will this integration result in social economy being overshadowed? Or will it provide a platform to scale to the broader economy? And I think that's going to be really interesting to watch this. And and, and that's why, why I say that um, policy evaluation would be critical, because I think learning, particularly from this EU lesson around integration of policy as opposed to standing alone, will, will really inform broader policies um, around the globe and particularly in Asia where I work. Uh, thank you, Francois. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I'm going to use uh, you and continue with you to, to go into our next uh, phase of the conversation. We just have 15 minutes or so left, but we want to also bring, because the International Organization for Public-Private Cooperation, the World Economic Forum, is our sister organization uh, as the Schwab Foundation, and we're, we're really interested in the private sector dimension. What role does private sector have to play here? Perhaps you can start, Jonathan, given you deeply involved in the policy making. What, what key tools do policymakers have to incentivize private sector investment and partnership with the social economy? Sure. You, you know, I, I go back five years and, and I, 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 I was having a conversation with an to be unnamed finance minister in Asia. It was a she, so that narrows it down slightly. And, and, and I spent a lot of time trying to convince her why impact investing was important, why we had to unlock private capital to solve the biggest challenges of our time. And she said, okay, Jonathan, you've sold me. I get that impact investing is important. I get we need to mobilize private sector capital for development objectives. What should I do? And, and you, you know me well, Francois, I'm, I'm very rarely lost for words, but I was. And I hadn't actually thought it through properly. So, so I kind of went away and thought, okay, let's do some thinking around this. Uh, and, and just last year, we launched a, what we call the Policy Making Guidebook for Impact Investing in partnership with the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing, um, supported by the OECD as well, in, in which we kind of turned, tried to turn impact investing and how we mobilize private capital for development objectives from what art to science. And, and, and on tools available to governments, we kind of came up with a framework around government as a market regulator. So to give an example, we worked with the government of Thailand to, to um, introduce fiscal incentives, which is essentially 100% tax break for investors in social enterprises. So very catalytic. 
Governments can also play a role as market facilitators. So, so to give another example, in Malaysia, we work with the government to set up the Social Impact Exchange, which links impact investors with social purpose organizations and mirrors kind of a traditional stock exchange. Uh, governments can also play a role as market participant. And, 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 and Mira mentioned the role of procurement there. But, but interestingly, we're working with the government of Bangladesh at the moment on a blended finance model. And you talked about how you unlock um, private capital um, in, in this space. And what's interesting there is um, this impact investment fund in Bangladesh is a sovereign fund. It's, it's government money. But they're looking to put that alongside and incentivize private money and maybe de-risk some of the early investments and, and the first losses to actually catalyze those investments. So, so, so there are th kind of three kind of a framework of how governments can play a role around regulator, facilitator, participant. Uh, and I will again emphasize kind of if there's a key point here is that many of these policies are in their infancy. And I think that's the key thing. We really need to delve down and really evaluate whether these have been effective or not. And I would maybe add to that, given that impacts investing in particular uh, and private sector um, engagement um, in, in the social economy and how you unlock that finance is still in its infancy. We still need to continue to innovate and really experiment with policies as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Re really, really helpful perspectives there. Um, Mirai, I want to come to you briefly uh, as time is starting to get the better of us. Um, but what can companies so, practically do? You've spoken about you know, all of the, uh, the challenges and, and, and the needs for, for governments, but what can companies do uh, to work practically with the social economy and the informal economy in context like India? So thanks, Francois. First of all, I've already mentioned in the context of social economy organizations, but it applies to companies too. invest. Please invest in tiny nano micro enterprises, particularly women's enterprises. One example I'd like to share is a local Indian company uh, provided working capital to our catering cooperative for a tiffin service, as we call it in India, basically providing lunches and dinners to families uh, with COVID patients. Um, who can't cook anymore, uh, support with marketing of our products. I mentioned it earlier in another context. Um, buy, help us sell our masks, buy our masks and sanitizers and so on. Third, include us in your supply chains. Uh, we will deliver. We will deliver quality products. We're trying to link our vegetable farmers with the large retail chains in India. Masks I've already mentioned, and of course on fair terms. This is not charity, this is business. Um, social protection, we have partnered with the mainstream insurance companies in India to develop appropriate micro insurance products for COVID. So that's a social protection example. And fourth, and most importantly, let us partner. Partner, as I said, this is not charity, this is business. We would like to work with companies Indian and overseas as equal partners. We need support in mentoring and developing our systems. Um, procurement, I've already mentioned, inventory management, financial management, but building it together so the processes and procedures are simplified and easy to understand for grassroots managers. And I promise you it will be a journey of mutual learning, a positive experience for all involved. That has been our experience so far. You might find us a bit slow. Patience is required. We didn't all go to business school. But um, we also, for our part, have to you know, come up to speed, be open, uh, be ready to extend ourselves as much as possible, be ready for capacity building. And I think, finally, a change in mindset in both sides. We inhabit different worlds. But our worlds can come together, and they must. If there's one thing this pandemic has taught us is that we are so interconnected, so interrelated. So we have to move forward together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marin, for those kind of very practical, concrete examples of, that are happening right now. Um, on the COVID Response Alliance, we've also been working on uh, questions of financial support, non-financial support, but also social procurement. And you spoke to all of those uh, dimensions. Um, uh, Gonzalo, clearly, you know, part of the journey working together with the private sector is uh, coming together on climate change. Uh, and of course, the social economy um, uh, is in Europe, but also beyond being thought of as integrating, as Jonathan was saying, uh, with uh, new green deals that are being proposed uh, across, the across the world. Um, 
tell us a little bit about how we ensure that, you know, in your role, you're, you're advocating for these big transitions these big policy changes, but also changes in industry, how do we ensure that those are inclusive uh, of social actors uh, and that we achieve the, the goals of a, of a more just transition and don't uh, push inequality further? Well, uh, honestly, Francois, that is a condition. We, we don't see any way we can solve the crisis without including all of the people, all of the social impact. So, so when it comes to climate mitigation, for example, you can see how youth and workers are two great examples of uh, really critical stakeholders. On, on one side, we know that we must reduce greenhouse emissions, increase natural capital, recover biodiversity, uh, change technologies, improve business models, etc. And all of it leaving no one behind. There is a really high expectation for just transition in every industry, in every region. Then on the other side, you have the youth as a fundamental group that is pushing for not only the creation of a better, healthier, surfier future, but also for being included in the discussion and the decisions that are being made. And on the other side, with adaptation and resilience, you mentioned uh, the race to zero with my dear friend Nigel Topping. Uh, we launched also a global campaign, a sister global campaign of race to zero called Race to Resilient, that is expecting to increase the resilience to climate crisis for 4 billion people in this critical decade. The main concept is to put people in the center, in our case, mostly through three big areas, coastal zones, slums or improving the condition of livelihood in, in cities and also small form uh, small farmers in in regions where the climate is uh, creating the the, the or, or, or worsening the conditions for those people so the idea is they can not only survive the crisis but thrive despite it thank you so much uh, gonzalo and i know you know to welcome people to to, to join you on the race to resilience uh, as part of this global movement. Uh, Sharon, uh, for you, I know personally, but also for Deloitte, um, championing environmental sustainability is, is a key priority for, for you. Um, but with your work in, in, in interest in, and support of the social economy, perhaps you can share from your perspective uh, the roles of private sector and social entrepreneurs can have in partnership in building these more inclusive, but also sustainable uh, practices in an economy. Yeah, thanks, Francois. I think they have a critical role. And I think the lines between truly social enterprises and traditional enterprises that also create a social benefit are increasingly blurring. You know, there's two greatest roles social and entrepreneurs can play seem to be holding constant. So providing for unmet social needs now while demonstrating an entrepreneurial and innovative approach to solving society's challenges which over time can spread to the mainstream. And as that social entrepreneurial model continues to be successful, both from an impact and profit perspective, the private sector has had the opportunity to follow suit and integrate impact into their operating models while still remain, remaining profitable. So some of the more compelling examples we've seen include using sport, it's a global phenomenon, and it's a really powerful tool for addressing social challenges. For example, football for good, and their pledge-based charitable movement, Common Goal, they're seeking to unite the global football community and mobilize the world's three billion football fans to support the United Nations global goals. Common Goal members, their players, coaches, executives, etc., pledge 1% of their earnings to a central fund, which is then allocated to high-impact organizations that harness the power of football to address social challenges in local communities around the world. But to respond effectively and to know where to focus, it's really important to have access to good data. And we're very proud at Deloitte to work with the Social Progress Imperative, which publishes a global index measuring social progress by country, which is independent of economic de development, the sort of GDP standard measures, because we know the two do not always go hand in hand. And that index looks at where societies are free, inclusive and protect the rights of individuals and minority groups and shines a light on inequality, enabling decision makers and citizens to respond effectively. You know, I think private sector organisations, including Deloitte, have got a key role to play in supporting social enterprises like Football for Good and the Social Progress Imperative, providing skills and expertise to help them grow and also creating connections to enhance their profile and amplify impact. 
you know, education is another key enabler to building a more inclusive and sustainable world. And we've got a commitment to expand opportunities for 100 million people by 2030 by working to make access to quality education a right for all. But the single biggest thing that I think governments, the private sectors, social entrepreneurs and citizens can do is to collaborate, to retain that spirit of common purpose, which has been so evident over the last year, to keep talking, to learn from one another, to share information, data and ideas, and to drive change to address the enormous challenges that the world faces. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for, for those perspectives, the commitments that you make and, and carry out, uh, and also uh, this urgent call to action for us to continue not only the dialogue, but also the action in collaboration with each other. So uh, a big thank you from, from me for, for all of you joining today uh, in the context of this European Social Economy Summit. There were so many points of connection, but also a, a recognition overall that there is this great convergence happening. And we're all part of this together beyond our single institutions and agendas and families. We are interconnected. Uh, as someone who's both a South African citizen and a European citizen, uh, thinking about this uh, as, as a global movement is really important to me. Um, and that, you know, you've all shown solidarity. And uh, I think that is part of the, the, the journey we're on together. Ultimately, social economy actors don't have the power, don't always have the voice, and they need collective uh, platforms uh, such as the summit, such as the networks you do, such as the partnerships you build, such as the alliances we build, the collective platforms uh, to have voice and to have authority and to have decision making uh, in how we shape our world. Uh, and I think that is, is what all of you are offering. There were many opportunities and calls to action in this, uh, in this panel. Uh, from the race to resilience to uh, the recommendations uh, from you, Mirai, in India, to the, 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 the research and experience that you've had, Jonathan, to Sharon, all of the work at Deloitte. So a big thank you from me and to the organizers and uh, good greetings and making sure that the rest of uh, this summit uh, continues to go successfully uh, as a platform for us to continue to work internationally hand in hand with Europe.